so next week I will be in Portugal at uh, Boomland where the Boom Festival, uh, Psy Trance and Culture uh, Festival and Art. I've heard it's the European Burning Man. I don't know if that's a widespread sentiment or analogy, but um, I have been to Burning Man here in the States, which seems, um, to me at least, to be this kind of the crescendo of uh, the religion of America and uh, the individual, you know, and, and the positive sides of this archetype of the individual, you know, is on display at Burning Man. And there's a lot of um, humor and irony in the whole and the whole thing, right? So it's like a celebration of the individual at the same time that we're burning this idea of the individual to the ground to 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 recall our um, collectivity and our um, you know the the extent to which we are interdependent and intradependent, right? So you you have to be radically. Uh, self-reliant at the same time that you're also also radically inclusive and radically uh, engaged with what's going on around you and I mean Burning Man I've always experienced as a kind of um, social sculpture and ideally right there's plenty of things we could be critical about but when you go to a festival you're not trying to be critical you're trying to participate in something and in, in um, yeah on the one hand being entertained and enjoying the art which will be on display there but you're also bringing bringing yourself and trying to contribute to to co-create an experience um a, a, a joyful experience while you're there with with other uh people so it's a kind of social sculpture ideally in joseph boy's sense and so i imagine boom is going to be something similar and um i'm giving a talk there at the liminal village uh, next Monday on the 24th of July at uh, 4 30 in the afternoon and I'm going to be exploring our moment in history and um, my talks titled love and death in the guy Anthropocene so that's Gaia and Anthropocene it's a, a name for the geological uh, well, it could be an age, an era, an epoch, depends how transformative we want to imagine it to be, but um, it's it's not just the Anthropocene, which is part of what geologists are uh, continue, continuing to debate about whether, you know, to rename the period either after 1945 or after 1610, or, you know, there are various places to draw the line where they would say there's evidence in the ge geological record of a layer of coal dust or radioactive uh, um, elements that is now like in the strata that could be measured millions of years from now. So they can draw a line and say, ah, this is a new, a new scene, <laughs> um, a new age or a new epoch or potentially a new era. I mean, if the Anthropocene or what I'm going to call after my colleague actually Sean Kelly who came up with this term the guy Anthropocene it could be the terminal um, phase of the you know the transition could be terminating the Cenozoic era which is 66 million years um, marking the moment the dinosaurs went extinct probably from an asteroid uh, meteorite impact um, and so that's what's happening now and and it's something human beings or particular um, um, particular human beings and their industrial growth uh, economies have been um, perpetu perpetrating and, and um, but it's also something that you know the earth itself is doing you know climate change is not something human beings invented though our activity industrial activity is um, and not just climate change, but a whole, you know, cascading series of, of ecological unravelings is being precipitated by our extractive uh, industrial mode of um, political economy. 
and um, you know we're about to tank the system. Um, and you know whenever a mass extinction has occurred in the past, and the fossil record leaves us with evidence of five due to super volcano eruptions or other asteroid impacts, or indeed it seems the first one, the oxygen crisis, um, where um, anaerobic bacteria were releasing oxygen as a waste product and poisoning themselves and, you know, creating a, a toxic environment. So there was pollution already at the very origins of life when bacteria ruled the world. I mean, let's be honest, the bacteria still ruled the world, but um, when there weren't any more complex organisms, animals, vertebrates, so on, um, there was this toxicity event, this, this pollution created by life itself and its metabolic process that needed to be adapted to. But life did adapt and actually was able to harvest the higher energy of the oxygen molecule to power even more complex uh, metabolism and thus consciousness. Um, and so when we relate to this moment in human history, yeah, it is an ending and yeah, there's a certain moral culpability for the damage, the destruction, the death um, that's being unleashed by this impulse to accumulate driving the global capitalist economy. But there's also something I would suggest inevitable about this. It's not the first time life has... I mean, if the whole planet is a living being, right, how does life evolve? Well, it, it's not competing with anyone but itself, and so it creates conditions requiring adaptations which will lure it beyond any past established form of order. So after every mass extinction prior to this one, within a few million years, there was actually more diversity of life, a, a greater variety of species than there had been prior to that mass extinction. And so life doesn't just survive, right, and struggle to exist. It responds to catastrophe with creativity and ratchets itself into, uh, you know, ever deeper intensities of, of experience and consciousness and, and value. And so, you know, what does the human being represent at this phase of the Earth's evolution? If, if we're to take seriously the fact that human beings are an expression of the Earth process, we're a species of organism, of animal, right? Um, as unique as we might want to imagine ourselves to be, we are, at the end of the day, as natural as leaves on a tree. So how do we understand the human event and the Anthropocene in a Gaian way, right? That's what referring to this moment as the Gaianthropocene would mean. And in this historical context, I want to talk about some very human, um, some, some very human dimensions of our existence, and that's death on the one hand. We used to think humans were, what made us unique as a species was our awareness of death and our sort of religious or spiritual response to that awareness that we will die in the attempt to understand where the ones we love go when they die, where we go when we die. And love, you know, I already mentioned it, would be the other, I think, especially human um, factor for us to consider here. Um, now, of course, we know that there are other species that are, or, or appear to be aware of death and that mourn the dead and, and even, you know, elephants and uh, other primates, they seem almost to, and crows, they seem to almost perform ritual responses to like that, that almost religious emotions were being elicited by these ritual responses to, to death and to the dead. And so 
we can't draw sharp lines here between human beings and other species, but this capacity that complex animals have to become aware of death seems especially pronounced in the human being. I think we can say that. And this capacity for love, um, similarly, it's obviously present in many animal species, particularly evident in the mammals, where you get extended parental care uh, periods to protect longer periods of childhood. And so as childhood is prolonged, um, this capacity for love and care and attention in a, in a social setting to one another becomes enhanced, right? And the human being is the most neotenous of all the species of animal of, and of primates, where we have the most prolonged childhood. And so we're malleable and capable of learning for a long time. Yeah, I, ultimately for our entire lives, if we, you know, once the childhood period ends and our bodies have matured, if we can continue to keep our minds youthful through acts of our own will, self-cultivation, we can stay children our entire lives. And I think, you know, keeping your mind youthful, even in old age, is why learning education needs to become understood as a lifelong process. It's not something you do until you get a degree at a certain stage to get yourself a job. You're always, you're always learning, right? And so you're always learning how to be human. You're always learning how to relate to death and to love. And then, you know, we're also aware of birth, right? These, these mysteries are sort of what, uh, I mean, birth and death encompass us on either end of our lives and the only way we seem capable of um, getting close to these mysteries is through love, right? So, you know, obviously birth comes from sex and sex requires love. I mean, there's different kinds of love, right? There's eros, there's friendship, there's, or, there's romance, there's, um, there's agape, there's divine, unconditional love. And, you know, there aren't sharp lines between all these different kinds of love either, right? But somehow love is the bridge through which we pass from birth to death. And, you know, a question I want to ask, I don't know that I can answer it, but to ask at least is what, whether there might not be a love bridge between death and a new birth. And I think there's a really important conversation to be had right now in the Gyanthropocene about the ethics of reincarnation. If we do want an ecological ethic, it's gonna to need to overcome this kind of shallow anthropocentrism and shallow individualism and allow us to feel as though all of the creatures that compose this planet are our kin. We are all related and my individual birth and death makes of me a link in a chain and really a network of chains, right? I mean, life is, we think, so abstractly as, as though we exist in a lineage, right? Like each of us, we have parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, but, you know, as you go back three, four, five, six, seven generations, you end up being related to a lot of people. Um, these numbers grow uh, exponentially, and there comes a point where the lineage is way more like a rhizome, and there are transversal connections from um, to different nodal points in this network, such that uh, if we are going to have a serious conversation about reincarnation, it's not going to be in terms of, you know, my separate identity migrating from one body to the next across the millennia. It's going to be a sense of karmic interconnection. Karma is always shared, right? It's always interactive, intra-active even, right? It's a recognition of our inseparability and the way that every action has a reaction in one sense but 
that the action is all, is not just reactive. It's free to varying degrees. I mean, and this is the whole human dilemma, right? Is that we recognize love as a bridge between birth and death, and we we contemplate this notion of of a love bridge beneath us, beneath life, between death and a new birth. I mean, many religious traditions have contemplated this, this underbridge, if you want. And I think part of finding the moral courage to respond to our moment as a species when collapse is not only inevitable as a prediction or projection, but, but actively transpiring around us, um, it's becoming less theory and more fact. And in that situation, I think we need to have a sense of identity that goes beyond just, um, you know, the partial forms of love that we might feel embodied as we are now between birth and death. And, and this, is, this is a valuable, essential, important experience being embodied between birth and death, right? This is where the action is, but there's also action on the other side. And it's only this complete cycle of birth, death, and rebirth that I think we get a sense for our eco ecological interdependence. And so when we think about the end times that we are going through right now, I mean, I think it's not supposed to be just this sense of of dread that we relate to this in terms of and it's not that we should still not do everything we can to leaven the suffering to, to lift people people's spirits in a time of great anxiety and uncertainty and um and suffering and but we can also relate to you know this end time and to death itself as as a transition right as an initiation to something new as a change of state as the crossing of a threshold and look nobody knows what happens when we die right and, unless you've had a near-death experience but i think just considering the thoughts i've shared as an, as a thought experiment might lead you to a sense of greater resolve about about how we can meet this this moment as like concerned earthlings or Gaians, right? If you choose to so identify. Death is not an accident, right? Mass extinction is not a somehow um artificial imposition that human beings invented and are imposing on the biosphere. It's happened before. That doesn't uh, remove moral culpability here. It doesn't uh, release us from any responsibility as a species for what we are doing to the earth. But, but extinction is part of evolution. Death is part of life. Not, it's not an accidental part of life. It is essential to life. Really, life is a life-death rebirth cycle always has been, always will be, right? Um, death is not an end, really, though. It's a process. It's a phase transition. And so it's possible that the entire cosmos as we know it, as a physical system, might die one day, right? The Earth itself, we know, because of our understanding of stars, and just thermodynamics, the earth will die. The earth will be swallowed by the sun. And so whatever value and meaning and purpose we might achieve here as human beings, but just as living organisms, is not going to be, if we can achieve any value here, it can't be something subject to the ravages of time. We must be tapping into something vertically, as it were, perpendicular to the horizontal course of, of history, which connects us directly to, to a source, to a, 
to ultimacy by which we might judge the value and the meaning and the purpose of, of our existence here and now on this planet at this moment in history. Right, and so rather than fearing the end or just having this anxious reaction to a projected future, just, you know, it's a process that we're always already undergoing and our purpose here is to become more conscious of that process so that we can begin uh, to cooperate with it, to become co-creative of history rather than having history happen to us. I mean, look, whenever we talk about history, we're, we're, we're drawing artificial lines between, between one age and the next. And how we draw these lines, which we can't avoid doing, it's simultaneously a, a religious, a scientific, and a political act. And, you know, part of what evolving consciousness in this moment of history would mean, I think, is recognizing how drawing these types of lines is also an artistic uh, act, right? And, and I think um, we're trying to learn to make history together as social sculptors, right? As, as artists, rather than being made by it. Right? How can we make history together rather than being made by it? And how can we, while making history, becoming artists, also become responsible to the natural history we are inheriting, right? There's human history, which is a subset of geo-history, right? Which is already, was already going on when we emerged. And we must become responsible for that geo-history. We must become uh, grateful inheritors of that. We are it. We carry forward its achievements you know, in pursuit of this sense of, of eternal value that we never finally reach and realize, but that we're nonetheless compelled to strive to attain 